I thought I would get ahead of this and record the review so that if you have any questions on the review on Wednesday, um, we can talk about that before the, the test on Friday. So uh, this is the review for Chapter 22. That's uh, control scatter radiation. So we talk about the primary beam. What we're talking about is the, the X-ray beam as it leaves the collimator housing. That's before it interacts with the patient. Primary beam, as a, a student or a technologist, you should never be exposed to the primary beam unless you are a patient who happens to be a technologist. Primary beam is before interaction with the patient. What comes out of the patient are your image-forming x-rays. That is what we refer to as the remnant beam. So the remnant beam are your image-forming x-rays, and they consist of photons that were penetrated through the patient without any kind of interaction, plus the scatter radiation that is formed inside of the patient. So definition of contrast is just difference. Um, high contrast would be a lot of difference. So it's difference in densities. So where we have high contrast, we have a lot of difference in between tissue types, um, the appearance of those tissue types. So uh, black and white images have high contrast. Gray images have low contrast. Contrast resolution is just the ability to see that contrast. Grayscale is the opposite of contrast. So where we have high contrast, we have a short grayscale. Where we have a long grayscale, we have low contrast. Latitude is the same thing as grayscale. Noise is any random fluctuation on the image. And that gets a little bit confusing whenever we're talking about uh, scatter radiation because scatter radiation would say lays down a, a uh, even layer of density on the image receptor, but the definition of noise is random fluctuation. So uh, any unwanted density is basically noise. So quantum model, scatter radiation are both types of noise. Scatter radiation is any type of uh, deviation of the X-ray beam from the collimator housing that goes off in a different direction other than straight from the housing onto the image receptor. So it bounces off an atom inside of the patient's body and goes off in a different direction than scatter radiation. A beam limiting device would be anything that uh, restricts the size of the, um, the beam of radiation and how much tissue you uh, expose to, to the x-ray beam. So collimators, cones, diaphragms are all types of beam limiting devices as opposed to grids clean up the scatter once it's created and transmitted through the patient. So beam limiting devices prevent scatter from being created and grids clean up scatter radiation after it's created. So uh, again, contrast resolution is difference and ability to see that difference as opposed to spatial resolution would be the uh, whether or not you can see the kind of the, the line that separates two different types of tissues. So where contrast resolution is being able to see the black and white in between two different tissues. Spatial resolution has everything to do with that structural line in between. So where does the bone end? That's your spatial resolution. Can you see the bone as bone? That is contrast resolution. So uh, the, the amount of primary beam that strikes the image receptor is very low percentage-wise, but it, uh, it changes with with changing KVP. So at very low KVP, um, the, the amount of primary beam that eventually transmits through the patient and becomes remnant beam is extremely low. Uh, we're going to say about 1%, but as KVP goes up at high enough, then we could have about 10%. So for test purposes, we're going to say about 1% or less. How do changes in KVP affect uh, X-ray production, again, we go back to the parem spectrum like what we've talked about quite a bit this semester. As we increase KVP, we increase output from the X-ray tube. So we increase production. That increases emission from the X-ray tube. It decreases absorption because it's higher energy X-rays. So the higher energy X-rays are more prone to, to uh, penetrate through the patient. 
Uh, scatter production, we're going to talk about in class tomorrow, but just in a word, we're going to say that it increases scatter production, but it's more complicated than that. Um, I had a question on email, um, and we're going to talk about that in class tomorrow, because um, if you've read through Bouchong, it says inaccurately that as KVP increases, um, interactions decrease across the board. But um, where it gets confusing is where you consider patient dose, and if you increase KVP, patient dose goes up. So it seems like you can't have it both ways, but you can, and I'll explain that in class tomorrow. The remnant beam is what comes through the patient. Um, sharpness of recorded detail, again, is, is the abruptness with which you can see the edge of the anatomy, uh, as opposed to visibility of recorded detail has everything to do with contrast. So we talked about patient dose. Um, as we increase KVP, we increase penetration, we increase patient dose. And you might see an increase in occupational dose because with the increase in KVP, you create more scatter radiation. So uh, all of those um, were an increase in KVP. So if you decrease KVP, all of that would reverse. Should KVP uh, be directly should KVP be what we use essentially to, to compensate for larger patients? And the answer is no. As we increase KVP, we increase scatter. If we increase scatter with the increase in KVP, then um, with the, the increase in, in patient thickness, patient size, uh, most of the time what we have is an increase in soft tissue. So with the increase in soft tissue, you also create more scatter radiation. So it's creation, more, more scatter radiation upon more scatter radiation. So it's not advisable. So we increase mass to, to compensate for larger patients. How does uh, KVP affect patient dose? We talked about that. It's we increase KVP. If you do nothing else but just increase KVP, you're going to increase patient dose. And I'm going to draw that out for you again tomorrow. Um, so, so uh, if you increase your KVP and decrease your mass, though, your, your patient dose is going to decrease. So if you increase your KVP by 15%, you can reduce your mass by a factor of two, cut it in half, and it's better for a patient. So high KVP, low mass techniques are better for patients, for, for patient dose. It lowers patient dose. What kind of techniques are better? No, I just did that. Um, can anything compensate for a lack of penetration? And the answer is no. If your KVP isn't high enough to penetrate through the patient, it doesn't matter how much mass you throw at it, uh, you just add a dose to the patient. So no, um, mass doesn't do anything for you. The computer cannot process anything onto the image that isn't there. So the image receptor has to receive those photons in order to create the image. So computer processing won't do anything for you. So for um, what precautions are best for technologists, and those would be the things we've been talking about for two semesters, time distance shielding. If you have to be in the room with a patient, wear a, uh, wear a lead apron, stand back as far as you can from the patient, remembering that the patient is the x-ray emitter for your patient dose or for your occupational dose. So the closer you are to the patient, the more radiation you're going to receive. If you can step back away from the patient, wear your lead apron, and maybe stand behind somebody who can't get away from the patient, whoever's running the fluoroscopy, then your, your occupational dose is going to drop to nearly nothing. You can't do that all the time, but uh, when you can, step back away from the, the table. So the, the three types of of beam restricting devices we talked about a second ago, and that would be aperture diaphragm, um, a uh, cylinder cone, and then you've got the variable aperture diaphragm, which are your collimators. Um, you've got two sets of collimators, remember, you've got one set on top of the collimator housing that you don't see, and that's that uh, multi-leaf collimator. And the purpose for that is to limit off focus radiation as opposed to the shutters that you do see are the ones you're most familiar with, and those are the the uh, the ones that, that restrict the, the beam into that square appearance that, that you see. So that's your variable aperture diaphragm. Um, what do beam restricting devices do for patient dose? Remembering back to last semester, 
and I think it was chapter one or two of Bu Shang's where where we went through the history. Uh, the the original beam restriction was just to to re- reduce the amount of tissue that, and it was the dentist Rollins that that came up with the idea, reduce the amount of tissue that he was exposing, thereby reducing the patient dose. Um, a secondary effect on that was our our contrast changed. So our contrast, as we increase collimation and reduce the field size, our contrast would go up whenever we're using screens and films. We might see a little bit of that in uh, digital, but not as it's not as dramatic as what it was whenever we're using screens and films. Density, remember substitute density or interchangeable uh, density in exposure, image receptor exposure. So what it's going to do to image receptor exposure is it's going to decrease the image receptor exposure. It'll decrease the amount of scatter that's created because it produces the amount of tissue that you expose. It does nothing for sharpness or recorded detail. Um, there, I'm not going to complicate that. Uh, visibility, it might improve um, the quality of the, the image. This is not quality of the x-ray beam, but the quality of the image. If we improve visibility, we improve uh, quality and we reduce the quantity of x-ray photons that strike the image receptor. If we reduce the number of photons that strike the image receptor, then we have to replace those photons. And how we do that is with the increase in mass. Um, so what happens uh, to the above as collimation is decreased, so field size is made larger, so we'll walk through that. If you uh, increase field size, decrease collimation, then patient dose is going to go up. Contrast may go down. Uh, your exposure to the image receptor would increase. Scatter radiation would increase. Still, you'd have no effect on sharpness. Visibility might decrease. Image quality would decrease, uh, and the quantity of x-ray struck in the image receptor would increase. Uh, so, uh, which type of beam restrictor is best for limiting off-focus radiation? That would be your aperture diaphragm, your variable aperture diaphragm, specifically that top set of um, collimators. That would be your multi-leaf collimators. When you utilize what technical compensation needs to be made for beam restricting devices. So, when, when you use collimation, you restrict, restrict the beam. You're... Rem- you're limiting the uh, exposure to the primary beam, limiting the the, uh, the scatter radiation that you're going to create, and that reduces the number of photons that would strike the image receptor. So the context of this particular question is if you shot the perfect image and it gave you the perfect index number on your uh, on your image and your finished product had the perfect index number, and then you went back and you shot it a second time with increased collimation, so you, you had a smaller field size, then some of that scatter radiation, some of the, those photons, you're not going to make it to the, the image receptor. And so what you should see, if you use the exact same technique uh, on the second image as what you used on the first image, what, what the result is going to be is you're going to have an underexposure at your image receptor. So in that case, you would need to increase specifically mass. You lost numbers, you need to add numbers. Mass is, is your factor that only affects numbers. KVP would affect more stuff. So um, what is reduced that causes this to be necessary? That would be scatter radiation. Remember, scatter uh, lays down a layer of density. So it's exposure. And if we remove that, then we're removing some degree of exposure. We have to to replace that. So uh, scatter radiation is removed. What should determine the size of the field? Um, The size of the field should always be determined by the the size of the anatomy. And the radiation field should never, so two two rules is the, the anatomy should determine the size of the field and the size of the field should never exceed the size of the image receptor. So even if, you, um, if you're if you doing a KUB, let's say, on a patient, um, then and you have to use the entire image receptor, uh, your 
in the patient is even larger than the image receptor, uh, you should not open your, your collimation to include all of the anatomy because it's just not going to find its way onto the image receptor. So uh, the size of the, the field should be determined by the, the anatomy, but if that anatomy is larger than the image receptor, just go with the image receptor. Uh, positive beam limitation is uh, automatic collimation. It doesn't really have a place anymore, and to, uh, to be completely honest with you, I'm not real sure that that is a testable ART question any longer. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I've not looked through the content specifications to make sure of that. So uh, just be familiar with the word positive beam limitation just in case it pops up on the registry. But uh, what it did was it limited the, uh, the beam that automatically collimated down to the field size or to the image receptor size. So it detected the image receptor in the bucky, automatically collimated just down to the bucky size. So uh, this big over big equals little over little is calculation of field size. The, we ran through that in class um, today's Thursday, so Friday. So uh, what we're looking at there is the uh, size of the, the projected field versus the size of the opening in the diaphragm or columnar housing. Uh, remember that you need to keep your, um, to make this formula work, you need to keep your uh, your light measurements across from each other. So uh, one would be your distance from your focus to your diaphragm opening uh, directly across from the distance between your uh, your focus and your um, image receptor, so your SID. So the SID distance would be your big, the, the uh, focus to the diaphragm opening would be your little, and then what we would have is the, the projected field size big um, across from the opening size for the little. So how close should you collimate to the anatomy of interest when, when collimation is smaller than film size? And that would be to collimate within uh, half an inch of the anatomy, no more than an inch of the anatomy. The reason for that is that the, the collimated field size is just the size of the projected light field. So the light field and the radiation field should line up perfectly in a perfect world. Uh, but there is a variance that it can be inaccurate to a certain degree and still be acceptable. So that, um, that amount of inaccuracy is basically 0.8 inches at 40 inches. So at a 40 inch SID, it's gotta be within 0.8 inches. And we'll talk about the significance of that in your sophomore year. Uh, but it's um, to make sure that if your collimators are inaccurate and you collimate down to the, just the, the size of the anatomy, if there's a, a, a difference between the projected field size and the projected light field size, then it, it kind of catches that. So uh, what things does the mirror in the collimator housing do for the radiographer directly and indirectly? All right, so uh, we'll probably need to talk about this in class so I can draw it out as well. Um, the, the mirror is directly in the x-ray beam. The light is actually off to the side. If we put the light directly in the x-ray beam, we would have an artifact on every image that we shoot. So it's off to the side at a perfect 45 degree angle. So the light bounces at a 90 degree angle and should parallel the x-ray beam. In addition to being at 45, the, the mirror being at a 45 degree angle, uh, the distance between the focus and the mirror has to be identical to the distance between the light and the mirror because what we're talking about is electromagnetic radiation and all of that will diverge at the same rate. So if they're at a different distances, you're not gonna see the, the um, proper uh, representation of field size through your light field. So what it does for you is it gives you that visual so that you can tell where your radiation field should be. Indirectly, what we get is uh, more um, inherent filtration. Uh, we call it inherent filtration even though it's outside of the x-ray tube. Uh, we're still gonna call it inherent filtration because it goes into the total calculation of, of filtration. 
uh, that formulation that comes up to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent, uh, the mirror counts into that. So uh, we're going to call it inherent filtration. Um, what thing, let's see, things that affect tech, uh, things that a technologist can manipulate to control scatter radiation. Uh, really, the main thing now is computer algorithm. Um, if you were to take an x ray, regardless of what your technique was, if you were to take an x ray and process, chest x ray and process it under ribs, it's going to come out looking like ribs. If you were to take ribs and process it under a chest x ray algorithm, look up table then it's, it's going to look like chest x-ray. So that's the main thing. Uh, marginally, you may have some, some differences with uh, collimation, grid use, um, KVP selection, things like that. So KVP, uh, collimation, grid use, and more than any of that is your computer algorithm or the lookup table that you, you use to process your image. All right, so uh, effects of KVP on scatter Compton um, and the, the PE ratio. So as we increase KVP, we get more Compton relative to PE. Um, so how we nullify the effects of high KVP on scatter region of film again is uh, column eight, one, and then two is to use grid. So if, if we use KVP, even in the presence collimation, if we use a KVP that is above 70 kvp then we have to uh, utilize grid because of the, the scatter that we create uh, really more specifically the, the scatter that is transmitted through the patient um, what kind of techniques lower patient dose we already talked about that high kvp low mass what might happen to the beam as it passes through the patient all the different types of interactions you have uh, thompson which is also referred to as classical scattering coherent scattering all mean the same thing, um, and that is uh, scatter radiation that almost parallels transmission. It occurs at very low energy levels, and it uh, can it can the, the X-ray beam, the overall X-ray beam, consists of a very small percentage of Thompson uh, interaction. So that's one. You may have photoelectric absorption as total absorption inside of the patient. And remember that you may have a Compton interaction that eventually becomes photoelectric. And that's going to play into what, what we're going to talk about on uh, tomorrow, on Friday. Um, and then you've got Comptons that bounce around inside of the patient and exit the patient. And uh, the thing that we probably under stress is that with each one of those Compton interactions, as we eject a, an electron, um, what we're going to have is, is creation of characteristic X-ray photon inside of the patient's body. So one Compton interaction could create multiple scatter um, photons that some might exit the patient, some of them, most of them probably would be absorbed inside of the patient. So uh, three different possible interactions, uh, Thompson, Compton, um, and photoelectric. And a fourth isn't really an interaction, it misses everything and and we've got full penetration of that x-ray photon. So there's really four types of, or four different things that can happen through those being interaction and one being no interaction at all. Um, so uh, does primary beam have more or less energy than the remnant beam? The primary beam is gonna have more energy than the remnant beam. Effects of changing body thickness on scatter radiation. So anything that, that increases the amount of tissue that you might, uh, that, that might be exposed increases the chances of uh, scatter. So it doesn't matter if your area is larger or thicker, you've got more tissue there. So each one of those interactions are possible in that type of tissue. So as as thickness increases or area increases, then we're going to have more scatter created. So in thicker patients, we'll get more scatter. Not all that scatter is going to penetrate through the patient. So in thinner patients, we get a higher percentage of penetration. <clears throat> what can be done to limit the effects of scatter reaching the film or the image receptor? 
that would be to uh, utilize grid, column eight, use proper KVP. What technical compensation should be used when faced with a larger patient? What should you increase? That would always be mass. Uh, to demonstrate collimation, how much of border should be seen on the edge of the film? Same answer as above, about a half an inch all the way around the, the, the uh, image receptor, all the way around the image. Um, remember that um, cropping is not the same as collimation. Collimation spares the patient from radiation dose and limits scatter radiation. Cropping does neither one of those. So uh, there is a place for cropping. There's, uh, there's legitimate reasons to crop, but you should never crop off information um, that's on the image receptor. So you overexpose the patient because you didn't collimate, then uh, don't crop that, that information off. Uh, the patient paid for that in, in dose, so that needs to be submitted to the radiologist. Could have a, an incidental finding in that exposed area. So uh, where, where you crop is um, on, let's say, like a lateral L-spine, where you create a lot, of, a lot of scatter radiation. But what you would do is you would crop down just to almost crop off your collimation, if that makes sense. So you collimate down to an area this big, your cropping should be slightly larger than that so that you can show that you did collimate for that image. Um, So uh, to demonstrate collimation, how much of a border should you see on the edge of the, or should you see on the image? That's at least a half an inch. And then even if you collimate, you want to you leave a little bit of that. So uh, does a grid, what does grid do for sharpness or recorded detail? Uh, nothing, really. Um, potentially, you could have a situation where you've got a, a decrease, actually, in sharpness or recorded detail because the grid has some thickness to it. So if it has some thickness to it, it could increase your OID a little bit and reduce sharpness of recorded detail. It's probably not going to be a, enough to, to really make a difference on the image. So we're gonna say nothing, but it's all about visibility. It absorbs scatter radiation, so uh, it would improve visibility. Uh, density, again, is image receptor exposure. It would decrease image receptor exposure. So what you need to do is increase your mass. Um, unfortunately, it's the unfortunate side effect of using a grid is that as um, as we if we add a grid, patient dose is going to go up drastically. So I would refer you back to that chart on Bucky Factor that's in the the uh, Bouchon. Um, those numbers represent how much of a change in mass you need by two times, three times, four times, even as much as six times, depending on the, the grid ratio and uh, how, um, how high your KVP is. So uh, you, your patient dose goes up dramatically. So if you use an eight to one grid and the, the Bucky factor for the KVP that you're using is three, that means that um, the, the amount of radiation that you're gonna use for that versus not use, it, it, that you would use if you did not use grid, would be three times as much, so your patient dose goes up pretty dramatically. Um, so it's always going to be mass. The different types of grids we're going to cover in class tomorrow. Uh, parallel grid, just things that you need to look for. Parallel grids have an infinite, a uh, infinite focus. So we'll talk about that in class tomorrow. But they have an in, infinite focus. They're easiest to create, they have an infinite focus, and uh, they have the greatest positioning latitude. Unfortunately, uh, because of the, the way they're constructed, and we'll take a look at this in, in class bar, there's always going to be some sort of grid cutoff. Um, it might not be detectable, the grid lines may be small enough that you, you can't really see it all that well, but it's present uh, for reasons we'll talk about in class. So you've got a uh, parallel grid, You've got a focus grid. In a focus grid, the, the grid strips um, try to mimic the divergence of the central ray. So in the center of the grid, you've got a parallel grid, but the further out it goes, the more these the grid strips lean. That leaning is what we refer to as canting, C-A-N-T-I-N-G, canting. So they, that just refers to leaning. 
they try to follow the divergent central ray. The purpose for the uh, the focus grid is that um, we don't have that grid cut off in the periphery that we have with a parallel grid. With a parallel grid, you've got the divergent central ray. Try to straighten this up a little bit. You got the divergent central ray, but the grid strips in the periphery are still uh, very vertical, so you're going to have some grid cutoff. With the focus grid um, in the periphery, they they lean to try to stay with the uh, the divergent central ray. So the positioning errors that you have, or the problems that you have with with a focus grid, are if your SID is too short and your divergence is too wide for the grid strips, you're going to have grid cut off in the periphery. The center where your grid strips are vertical, you're not going to have that issue. But in the periphery, it becomes a problem. So if you get too close or too far away, so that the canting of the grid strips don't parallel the divergence of the central ray, you get grid cut off in the periphery. Another problem is that if your central ray, all right, so the center of the grid is here, and your central ray is positioned over here, your grid strips are already starting to lean. So you've got to be centered to the middle of the grid. If they're centered off to the side just a little bit, you're going to have that, that canting or the leaning against the divergent central ray, so you're going to have grid cutoff. Um, and very dramatic grid cutoff, and, and the, the words you need to look for for this are dramatic, is if you take a... Um, focus grid and you turn it upside down so it's inverted so that the the tube side is actually towards the image receptor now your divergent central ray is still coming down like this but your grid strips are going up like that so where you've got good density is right dead square in the middle of the the grid but you you've got sudden abrupt dramatic grid cutoff anywhere except for right dead square in the middle of that grid so there's positioning uh, issues for the uh, the focus grid, and again, we'll we'll take a look at that in class tomorrow. Um, the benefits are to to the focus grid is that it uh, less obvious grid cutoff in the periphery, but the positioning is um, you you've got to use it with certain SIDs. You um, have an issue with uh, um, you know, inverted grids with centering, um, so less positioning latitude. And then you've got another type of grid that basically takes two grids and it stacks it on two stacks two grids on top of each other. So in in those types of grids, what you have, and most of the time it's going to be parallel grid, but you've got one grid and then you've got another one going in the opposite direction, so that your grid strips overlap like that. So the uh, in most grids, you can angle with the long axis of those grid strips. So if the grid strips are going this way, so top of the grid, bottom of the grid, off camera, you can't see it. Grid strips are going this way. You can angle across or with the long axis of the grid. But what you can't do is angle against the grid strip. You get grid cutoff. The problem with a, a, uh, a what they call cross grid, or sometimes I'll call them a cross-hatch grid, H-A-T-C-H, cross-hatch grid, is that you can't angle in any direction. So the, the X-ray beam has to be perpendicular to the grid at all times. And to make matters even worse, they can have a focused cross-hatch grid. And what that does is it takes um, grid strips that are canted in this direction, and then grid strips that are canted in this direction so that um, you've got no positioning latitude. If you're not positioned, not just to the grid itself, perpendicular to the grid itself, but perpendicular to the absolute center of the grid, you're going to have grid cutoff. Um, so we have different words for those. Um, Off-level grid would be the grid is tilted, so it would be like angling against the, the grid strips. Off-level just means tilted. Off center uh, would be that you're not centered to the middle of a uh, focus grid. Inverted grid means the, the focus grid is upside down. A parallel grid doesn't matter if it's inverted or not. A parallel cross hatch grid doesn't matter if it's inverted or not. Um, so off focus, SID is wrong. 
um, off center, you're not centered to the, the center of the grid uh, laterally. Uh, longitudinally, it doesn't really matter, but laterally, it does. Um, I'll focus, and there's. it seems like there's one more. We'll cover it in class tomorrow. So what a focal range is, is specific to your focus grids. So with a focal range, um, or what a focal range is, is the, the set of SIDs that you can use with that grid before it gets out of focus. So your, your focal distance or your focal range on a grid may be 36 inches to 80 inches or something like that. So if you get past 80 inches, then again, you've got some, uh, it's the similarity between the divergent central ray and the canting of the grid strips are such that you're going to get excessive grid cutoff. If you go below that 36 inches, again, you're going to have grid cutoff. So the focal range just indicates the distances that you can use with that particular grid, specific to focus grids. Um, so uh, anytime you use stationary grid, you're going to uh, potentially see um, grid strips. So grid cutoff, grid strips, really not so much grid cutoff. So uh, what that is, is that you're seeing the lead, uh, lead strips on end, so radiopaque strips on end, and what the, it's just going to look like stripes. Um, if you use a grid that has a very high frequency, uh, you're less likely to see those because they're very, very small and it's harder for your eyes to pick them up. So what causes that decreased density is that you're looking at that absorber and there's so much absorber there that it's, uh, it's completely blocking even the, the good x-rays that pass through the patient. Um, a moving grid is what we use in our x-ray tables and the purpose for the moving grid is to, to move it around so they think like a breathing technique, T-spine or sternum. Um, with the, the lung field moving, you don't see the uh, lung markings, right? So the uh, moving grid does the same thing. It kind of blurs out those, those grid lines so that you don't see them. Um, if you're, you're using a, a table bucky and that the reciprocation, there's two different ways that a, a, uh, a grid might move in the, in, the, in the bucky. One is reciprocation, just like the law of reciprocity means back and forth. A uh, reciprocating grid just goes, you know, back and forth, just like that. Um, and then there's oscillating grids, and oscillating grids kind of go in a circle. So, uh, and the purpose for that, again, is to blur out those grid lines. If you work on a piece of equipment that that movement, whatever causes that movement, uh, there's a failure in the, in the Bucky system that, um, that makes it a stationary grid, then, of course, you're going to have grid lines again. Okay, so... Um, lost my place. So if it were to move too slow or not at all, then potentially you would see grid lines. So a contrast improvement factor is a mathematical equation. We'll really get into that. It's uh, what we call K factor. We'll get into that in in um, in uh, sophomore imaging, and that is basically how much scattered does the grid? How effective is the grid? So con con contrast improvement factor would be a, um, a comparison of the contrast with a grid versus without a grid. So uh, we talked about the, the efficiency of grids and what, what types of grids were most efficient. Higher grid ratios, most efficient grids. So uh, what we would have is a contrast improvement factor with a grid with a high ratio would be better than a grid with a low ratio. So uh, the higher the number, essentially, the, the better cleanup it has, uh, the higher the contrast improvement factor and the more efficient the grid. So uh, grid ratio is the, um, the defines the effectiveness of grid. And mathematically, it is the height of the grid divided by the, the width of the interspace material. And it's a ratio, so it would be... Um, like if, if we had one that was, uh, the, the grid strip was eight millimeters high, it would be awful high, but eight millimeters high and there was one millimeter in between, 
a BA to one grid. It's eight high and you know one in between. And we can get to that in a lot of different ways. If it was only four high, four millimeters high, and it was half a millimeter in between, that's still eight to one grid. So um, it's the height divided by the, the distance in between. And I mentioned this in class last Friday that you're going to have a tendency to go the height divided by the thickness of the grid strip. And that's not it. It's the height of the grid strip divided by the distance in between or that the thickness of the interspace material. So uh, contrast improvement factor increases as grid ratio increases. Talked about that a minute ago. Um, but as grid ratio increases, then our exposure to the image receptor is going to decrease. Our contrast, if you can visualize it, increases. Visibility of recorded detail would increase. Sharpness of recorded detail would decrease. And unfortunately, as grid ratio increases, patient dose increases as well. So grid radius just refers to... So grid frequency uh, has to do with the number of grid strips in a given distance. So uh, maybe line pairs, or not line pairs per millimeter, but grid lines per millimeter uh, per inch. So uh, the higher the grid frequency, the, the higher... Um, the higher the number, the higher the grid frequency, the more grid strips we're going to have in a, in a given distance. A grid radius, again, has to do with the, the effective range of the grid, how high a um, SID you can have or how low of an SID you can have. So that refers to the distance SIDs that you can use with a focused grid. Uh, grid cutoff is anything that would cause you to visualize uh, those grid strips, mispositioning of the grid or the, um, the x-ray beam in relationship to the grid. So the Bucky factor is the what we were talking about before, how much of mass change that you need um, whenever you either introduce a grid or you change grid ratios. So uh, your Bucky factor would increase if you go from no, or let's say a low ratio grid to a higher ratio grid, or you would have to utilize the bucket factor if you were going from no, from no grid to uh, presence of a grid. What needs to be increased is always going to be mass. Um, what type of grids have canted strips? Uh, again, would be a focus grid. It just means a leaning to try to keep the grid strips parallel to the divergent central ray. So if the central ray isn't centered to the grid, um, then you have uh, off-centering, you have uh, you know, grid cutoff. If the grid is inverted, drastic grid cutoff um, in the periphery, uh, almost immediately. So uh, those are the things that you're going to look for is drastic grid cutoff and immediately out of the center of the, the grid. So you're going to lose density right away. Um, so... The answer to this one, uh, type of grid has two sets of grid strips perpendicular to each other. That would be a cross or cross-hatched grid. And centering will be an important. Um, you, you can't angle the central ray in any direction. And if it's a focused cross-hatch grid, then you have to be centered directly to the middle. The, the beam diverges in three dimensions, and the, the canting of the grid strips are in two dimensions. So you have to be centered up perfectly on a focus cross edge. So centering is vitally important. Uh, purposes for or the causes of grid cutoff we already talked about. Um, so in mammography, generally speaking, it's a low ratio grid, uh, very low KVP, even though we're shooting through a lot of soft tissue, it's going to be low ratio grid. Also in pediatric imaging, it's going to be a very low ratio grid. Uh, if you ever go to work in a pediatric hospital, probably the chances are you're going to be utilizing like a 5 to 1 grid. And the purpose for that is because in a pediatric hospital, you're primarily taking x-rays on, on uh, young patients, developing bones, de developing reproductive system, developing bone marrow. Um, you're going to utilize a, a low ratio grid to keep, keep your patient dose down. 